Das will ja. <lacht> well, thanks for the introduction, Jeff. I'll, I'll try to live up to the expectations in the talk. So I'll talk about I'll talk about meta learning and self play, which are two topics which I think are interesting and exciting and worth talking about. But before I dive into the technicalities, I want to give you a little bit of an overview about why neural network neural networks actually work. Kinda, I don't know for sure how much background everyone has in machine learning. I assume some, but I also think there's some chance not everyone is absolutely fully familiar with everything. And so this, I think, is the most, in some ways, the most important slide. This is why deep learning works. And so it's not obvious that deep learning should work. And so if you want to, so what's really happening is the following. If you want to solve the generalization problem completely, it's actually possible to prove mathematically that all you need to do is to find the shortest program that explains your data. And that's something you can prove. And the proof is easy. It's just not well known. And if you're interested, I could tell, to tell you about it offline I'm after, after the talk. But the point is, intuitively, it just makes so much sense. If you can find the shortest program that explains all your data, then you can generalize as well as you want. The short program can just take all the regularity out of the data and put it into the short program. Now, we don't do this because we cannot find the shortest program which explains the data. But if we could, it'd be great. It's not computable among, that's one of the reasons why we don't do it. But, you know, we can't do short programs, but maybe we can do small circuits. And that's what deep learning is all about. It turns out, through a great fortune, which we currently cannot explain really well, that we are able to find the best small circuit that explains the data. And so that's what a neural network is. A neural network is a kind of circuit. And so, oh, wrong direction. And the back propagation algorithm can find a circuit, the best circuit, and that's it. So short programs are the best thing ever. If you could have it, you would have massive, overwhelming generalization. That cannot be done. But circuits are kind of close. You can build a computer out of circuits. If you have many layers of circuits, you can perform all kinds, compute all kinds of functions. And it turns out if you can solve the circuit search problem. Like in fact, this is why I believe that the backpropagation algorithm is so fundamental, because it solves this fundamental problem. And like it solves it, this problem is basically solved for all practical purposes. And so that's why I think that, I think that the, this is why it's going to stay with us until, until the very end. And so what's really going on is that we can think of <clears throat> training a neural network as solving a neural equation. You've got your parameters. They have all these different degrees of freedom. And every training case introduces a small constraint. And I you may just can imagine the entropy flowing from the training data into the parameters, eventually reducing the degrees of freedom in the parameters. But the crux. You know, the reason why deep learning works, the reason that the community now has the audacity to talk about AI, which was not the case before, is that we have this one algorithm, which is called the backpropagation, which was invented by Jeff, which can just find the best circuit. <laughs> but, but the point is, the problem of circuits of finding the best circuit is solved. And if you could find the best, the best short program, you could really solve generalization in a way that cannot be improved upon. But we can't do that. So we're going to do the next best thing, which is find the best small circuit. And that's what deep learning is. You just have your training data, and you just let the information flow from the training data into the parameters. And the means of this information flow is the backpropagation algorithm. And it just works again and again and again on every problem without exception, because it doesn't care what problem to solve. And I think that's the most amazing thing. That's why, that's, why any, that's why people care about deep learning at all, even to the slightest bit. Now I want to talk a little bit about reinforcement learning as well. So reinforcement learning 
has two properties which make it interesting. So the first property of reinforcement learning is that you have, as a framework, it's a pretty good framework. You have a framework where you have a stochastic, uncertain, unknown environment, which can be whatever you want, more or less. And you have an agent which is trying to achieve goals in this environment. And yeah, it's a great framework. But what's more interesting is that fairly good reinforcement learning algorithms exist. That's the interesting part. It's not just the framework. The framework is cool. But it's the, interest, the reinforcement learning algorithm that can actually solve problems. That's what makes it really cool. And that also means that if you're going to improve your reinforcement learning algorithm and make it extremely good, then you'll be able to achieve a system which is truly powerful, that can achieve really complicated goals in the real world. But that's basically, OK, the laser doesn't work. It's because good reinforcement learning algorithms exist. They are good in a sense that they can do useful things, but they are nowhere near as good as they could be. So like one thing I don't really know is kind of what's the state of knowledge of the, of the, of the crowd. So how, how, please raise your hand if you are very familiar with reinforcement learning. OK, so actually, please, please raise your hand if you're very familiar with deep learning. Yeah. So I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the context setting. So basically, oh, there's also a whiteboard. I might use that. But basically, you just say, hey, I've got this beautiful diagram which says I have this agent and I send some actions and I get my observations and rewards. And the environment is stochastic and big and complicated and it's given by the world. And my agent is a policy and I can just run my agent and calculate its expected performance. And that's how good it is. So now I have an optimization problem, a mathematical optimization problem, find the best agent. That's the reinforcement learning problem. And so it's very clear that this is a very general framework because it, it, it's, not, it's not only, it's not only, it doesn't only deal with passive perception, it also deals with achieving goals. And you can have a very complicated goal that you specify somehow. You can specify how well you've done. And then you just run your agent a bunch of times, figure out the expected performance of the agent. And I try to solve the problem of maximizing this. Now, of course, the agent has to be a neural network. Because what else is going to be? You know, I mean, there is, there is, it, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's an objective statement of fact. There is nothing, there is no other substrate which can both represent lots of different things and which can be learned in this generic way. So yeah, your agent gets some observations, produce some actions, you can do it again, and you run it for a while, then you get your performance. And then you ask yourself, how should I change my connections to do better next time? And I'll give you the 100% of the intuition in reinforcement learning in two, in two sentences. Here's what happens. You got your agent, and your agent actually has some stochasticity in its actions. So some so your actions are a little bit random. You run your agents with the random actions. They're not totally random, they're a little bit random. And you get some performance. And if your performance is better than what you expected, you say, this was great. I want to do more of that again. These great actions increase their probability. This is the core of reinforcement learning. It's not as advanced as it could be. It's still pretty unsophisticated right now. And basically, all it says is, do something random. Do something you did not predict. You, you, you don't really know what the consequence of it will be. And then see if you like the result. And if you like the result, treat it as training data. So that's, a sim that, that's a really simple idea. And it can be formalized in a variety of ways. So the most direct formalization of the idea of, of this like, direct idea of reinforcement learning, we just try something randomly, and if it does better than average, do more of that. That's the policy gradients. So you've got your cost function, which is this thing. This is a cost function which tells us how well our agent is doing. You run your agent in the world, and then you get a score. Your agent got three points of goodness. You run it in the world again, you got 2.5 points of goodness. And every time it runs in slightly different actions, there is randomness. You take an action, you see the consequence. 
And then if things turn out better than expected, you say, this is great. My neural network should learn to produce more of this kind of output in these circumstances. Oh, yeah. So if you take the cost function and you go through the trouble of differentiating it, you're going to get the likelihood ratio policy grade, you know, you're going to get the policy gradients. And there is some math, but we don't really need to look into that. It's really, it really truly boils down to, okay, who have seen math likelihood? Okay, so it's like maximum likelihood on your actions were the good actions, the actions that lead to success and big weight. And that's all, the, that's, that's all there is to it. And it turns out that if you scale it up a lot, it works pretty well. There's also a different approach, which is called Q-learning. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it here, it's a little bit more complicated than the yeah, so it's, it's a little bit more complicated than the previous, than the, uh, than the policy gradient. It's a bit harder to understand. But it has one advantage that's actually important for some of the work I'll tell you about later. It is off policy. So policy gradients, you just, you, you, you run some experience, and then you see, okay, given my experience, what do I need to do to improve? You learning, you can also learn from the experience of someone who is not you. You can learn from someone else's policy. It's like, let's say you're really good at, you, let's say you want to learn to ride a bike, and you are okay at riding a bike, and then you see someone who is worse than you who is riding a bike, you can still learn from their experience. This is what Q learning lets you do. It lets you learn from the experience of policies other than yourself. And it's going to be important for a mildly technical reason in the future. So if you found this a little bit confusing, don't worry about it. It's just a technicality. But anyway, the conclusion is that reinforcement learning algorithms exist, and they're pretty good. Let us continue to the next slide. Oh, this previous slide now. OK, so I will actually give you just a brief explanation of what Q learning is. Now I'll explain to you what the Q function is. So the Q function is basically the answer to the question of, if I do something, how good it is. That's what it is. If, I take, if I'm in a certain state, I take a certain action, how good do I think it's going to be? That's, the value, that's what the Q function is. So for a given state and a given action, that's, that's a transition, I'm going to get some future. And this future in this rectangle, that's the Q function for this state in this action. So I would say that this is meant to be like, yeah, so hopefully this clarifies what the Q function is. If it doesn't, don't, wouldn't worry too much about it. Just one more thing here. The Q function is recursive. Because then, if you get to state S prime and you take action A prime, you have this, like this inner rectangle is the Q function of S prime, S prime and A prime. So you have this recursivity to the Q function. Because it just tells you, if I'm here and I take an action, how good is it going to be? Well, OK, I took one step. Now I'm, I can just basically repeat this whole argument all over again. So the Q function is recursive. And you can estimate it recursively with the Bellman equation. And so like if you find this kind of stuff interesting, and you, find, and you find yourself not being able to understand all the details completely from my presentation, just read up on it. It's really, the amount of depth here is very limited. And so I think, I think, I think it's going to be worth, worth the effort. So yeah, the real potential here is that we could build a really good reinforcement learning algorithm, improve it in a variety of ways. And once we do so, you know, perhaps you could make the statement that the purpose of our field will be achieved. I think this is, you know, this is not fully, this is not a 100% accepted statement by everyone, but it's definitely a lot of truth to that. If you have a truly, really great reinforcement learning algorithm, then you can achieve whatever, you know, you could use it, actually plug it in where the environment is going to be our, the real world, and see what it's going to do.
Okay, next I want to start talking about meta-learning. So meta-learning is this cool idea that you learn to learn. Where you say, okay, well, we don't know what a good learning algorithm is. We are just human researchers. What do we know? Maybe we will use our bad learning algorithms to learn good learning algorithms. This is the idea of meta-learning, that you can somehow learn to learn. And it has a fairly... The idea of meta-learning is still in the promising stage. But it's, it's pretty cool. And you can already do, do a fair bit of it. And so I want to start by just telling you like, how to think about it. I think the first... I think we can see from our own experience from our own experience that as we as we grow up and mature and gain experience, our ability to solve new problems increases. We acquire strategies and we acquire knowledge. And so it would be nice if we had systems which had some of that element as well. And so that's what meta learning is trying to capture. So one of the most popular and simplest approaches to meta learning is to reduce meta learning to supervised learning. By the way, I just, just, who knows what supervised learning is? And who understand, who knows that, who, who knows that supervised learning on a really big computer and a big data set can solve any problem? Just you. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's true though. <laughs> well, supervised, you know, whether you can solve any problem or most of them, it is definitely true that if you have a large training set and a large neural net, then you can solve a lot of problems. Supervised learning is unquestionably very powerful. So meta-learning says, okay, well, can we take some of this power and instead of use it to solve a problem, we will try to use it to learn to learn. So the idea is we will reduce meta-learning to supervised learning and later to reinforcement learning by saying, well, we will treat each training task as a training case. And so the way it looks like you have an architecture which kind of looks like this. You have a neural net, which is your meta-learner now, and you give it as input all your input-output examples of the task plus the test case, and the output is the prediction. So you take your good old neural net, maybe sprinkle it with some of the more recent innovations like attention, and I can give it all the information about the task plus the test case, and that's in meta-learns. And I want to tell you about two success stories of this approach. So one of the success stories is the Omni data set. I believe it was introduced by George Tenenbaum's lab. I don't know the first paper where it was introduced. I know that it's definitely been used in this uh, paper by Brendan Lake, which made it to science. Or basically they've designed these different characters. And this figure is from, from that paper, by the way. So they designed these different characters. They had like, I believe they had a thousand different characters and they had 10 examples of each character. Or maybe 10,000 different characters, but something of this order. 1,600 different characters and 10 examples of each character. Yeah, thank you. And so this data set was designed to show that deep learning is limited. But it turns out that if you simply say, OK, I'm going to use this approach to learn to solve this kind of task quickly, then it just works. And you get basically superhuman level performance. The best result by Mishra et al, they get 98% on one shot, 20 way classification. So you give it one example of the class, and you give it a test case, one of 20, that belongs to 20 different classes, and it just needs to tell you that they belong to the same class or not. And if you formulate it in this way, then suddenly you can have very rapid learning. And it looks really promising, it looks really encouraging. But yeah, look, if you reformulate the task of learning to learn as a supervised learning task, or later as a reinforcement learning task, then we will see that actually you can learn quickly. You can train a neural network. Basically, the neural network becomes the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm is now here in all the connections. So that's really cool. Another success story, which has a different flavor, but it also fits under the learning to learn umbrella, is the neural architecture search by Zop and Barrett, Zop and Kwok Lee, where they just say, you know, we have one task, we just want to find the best possible architecture, neural net architecture for this task. Can we do that? 
by just searching really hard with hill climbing. And it turns out that it works pretty well. And one really great thing about doing things like architecture search is that an architecture takes a very small number of bits to specify. And because of that, it can generalize. Things that have small number of bits to specify have a chance to generalize, while things that have a lot of bits have less chance to generalize. So this is another success story of meta-learning. But meta-learning is still a promising idea. Like for example, you go here and you say, look at this. Look at how quickly it learns to solve to recognize the characters from a new class really quickly. Maybe we could use it to solve many other things. But it turned out to be not so easy. So now that I've, been, now that I've uh, said the context, I want to actually talk about some of the work that we've done at OpenAI on meta-learning. This is one paper by, called Hindsight Experience Replay. It was done by Andrich Martin, Martin Andrichovich and lots of other collabor collaborators. And the, idea, the goal here is to try and address the problem in reinforcement learning. So one problem in reinforcement learning is exploration. If you're reward, so you are, keep in mind, look, remember how your reinforcement learning engine actually works. You receive your rewards, you take your actions, and at first they're pretty bad random actions. You receive your rewards. So your reward needs to be well designed for the agent to succeed because it's not very smart at first. And if it gets no reward, it's not going to learn. So you need to do something. Maybe you can modify the reward to make it dense and make it easy to work with. <clears throat> or maybe you could give it some, some expert demonstrations. I think these are all good ideas. But I want to present to you another idea, which I think is really cool. Like the idea is, is, is spiritually correct. So let's change the problem formulation a little bit. Instead of saying that you want to maximize a reward, instead, let's say that you want to reach a state. You want to reach a state in your system. And let's say you attempt, so here is the diagram. Let's say you tell your policy, hey policy, can you please reach state A? It will not succeed. It will reach state B instead. Well, we can interpret the situation in one of two ways. One interpretation that this is an unsuccessful example to reach state A. But it's also a successful example of reaching state B. So we can use this failure to teach the system to perform something else, to reach state B. So it's really simple. Anytime you do something, even if you don't succeed to do the thing you intended to do, you succeed in doing the thing you ended up doing. That's true. So you could use that for learning. And so can you design a reinforcement learning algorithm around it? You definitely can. But it has to be a Q-learning based algorithm because the algorithm is of policy. When you try to reach A, this is on policy data for A. This is your policy trying to reach A. But this is not the behavior of a policy which tries to reach B. If you were to try to reach B, the policy would do something else. So you need an off policy algorithm in order to be able to benefit from this data. This is why the, the uh, Q-learning like algorithm is important. And so since we tried it on robotics, on, on simulated robotics tasks, we've used the DDPG algorithm, which is a continuous version of Keylearn. And I just want to show you the results because they're cool. Let's see the video. Now I want to say that like the, an important caveat here is that in this example, we are being a little bit unfair to DDPG because we use a very sparse reward. You get a reward only if you are within some epsilon distance of the final target. But under these regimes, it works really well. So I, I think, so if you look to the left, you'll see that DDPG will very quickly, sorry, the D, DDPG is on the right. It's not getting the reward and it's basically going to give up. Whereas on the left, you have DDPG and her and it just pushes the block in this very dynamic and cool looking way. So that's nice. There will be more tasks. Now it needs to push this green air hockey puck towards the goal. 
And it just says that so in this regime, where the reward is really sparse, it has an overwhelming advantage over, over, DDPG, over DDPG. Now, one thing I should say is that we found that these kind of tasks were pretty hard, pretty hard to do even when you try to shape the reward as much as possible. In fact, the reason we came up with this algorithm was because we tried to solve this task that we showed you by shaping the reward. And we found that it wasn't very satisfactory. Yes? Just a question about, uh, so if, uh, under what conditions of the action space and state space can you sort of uh, say that this algorithm succeeds? For example, you know, I mean, these were all motion limited by motion planning, so maybe the state space is... Sorry? Most of these algorithms were motivated by motion planning, right? Where you have like a, maybe the action space is maybe small three-dimensional vectors, and maybe the state space is, let's say, the set of opposition or something. Uh, so these are relatively low dimensional spaces. Like what if your action space was, you know, n dimensional or n like 200? Yeah, so, 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 we've, so we've had success with this on 200 dimensional state, state space, action spaces and state, you know, state spaces. There is no problem with action space. It's really the state space which poses a problem. I don't think it will work on, on a million, dimension, million dimensional state, although it's one of those things that you need to try really hard before you can conclude that it's not going to work. Because if you run it with a very large mini batch, who knows what's going to happen? So anyway, that's the algorithm. Now, we did discover that when you take the more basic algorithms and you scale them up, then they overcome their deficiency and eventually can match the performance of this algorithm. But this one, the hindsight experience replay, it's quite a bit more data efficient and it works. It works well when you in, in the small mini batch regime as well. It doesn't require a very large mini batch only. So anyway, this is what we have on the uh, hindsight experience replay algorithm. Let's see what's going on. Yeah. And so I think I think that in an important way this algorithm is spiritually correct because it makes use of a bigger fraction of the data that's given to it. In conventional reinforcement learning algorithms, if let's say you try something and you fail, then you don't learn much from it. This algorithm tries to avoid that, it tries to learn from the, fa from the failures because it simply reframes, it reframes failure as a different kind of success. And so like, what, what would be like the important next step to push it forward? That would be to learn state representations in high dimension, you know, if your, obs if your observations are extremely high dimensional, you get to see your video stream, what should be these goals? Where do they come from? So a good answer is needed there. Maybe it's going to be representation learning, maybe some other kind of auxiliary objective, but this is the bottleneck for the kind of algorithm. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about sim to real with meta-learning. Change the topic a little bit, Stay, still staying on the topic of meta-learning. So one other thing that we've encountered, what we've been trying to do is to train policies in simulation and then get them to perform well on actual physical robots. I mean, it seems like a pretty good idea because it's much easier to do things in simulation. Simulations are fast, they're cheap, and you can, if you have more computers, you can scale up your experience. Now, the problem is that the simulation is not the same as the real physical robot. It is related, but it is also different. And there are many things which aren't being modeled. And so if you simply try to train your policy in simulation and then deploy it on the real robot, it's just not going to work. So we had an idea. We wanted to use the ideas of meta-learning to solve this problem. So how do you want to do it? Well, let's say that you train a recurrent policy, not a, not, not a feedforward policy, but a recurrent policy. And your recurrent policy doesn't solve the task for just one setting of the simulator. But instead you say, well, what if you were to randomize the gravity and the friction and the masses of the different objects and the strengths of the torques and pretty much everything you can, anything you can think of. So now you take, so now you don't have just one simulator, you have a family of simulators. 
pick it randomly, you pick one randomly, and you put your controller, your LSTM, inside this randomly chosen simulator. So now the LSTM does not know what simulator it is. It doesn't know what masses, what, what the masses are. It doesn't know what the friction coefficients are. It doesn't know all these things. But it still needs to succeed to solve the task, which means that it must learn a mechanism for inferring all these hidden parameters. So it's a really simple idea. You just say, OK, I'm going to create this very robust policy, which can do a little bit of learning on the job by adding a great deal of randomization to different aspects of the simulator. And then the question, is it going to be enough for, for solving a, a real robotics task? And right now, I'm going to show you just preliminary work, but it's still encouraging. So here is a baseline. Here's what happens when you just try to directly tr do, do the tr uh, transfer learning from sim to real without doing anything special. So it's kind of shaking. Oh, it succeeded. So that's good. So it really kind of, the mis it's not able to understand where the mistakes are coming from. And so it does these undesirable behaviors. It is unable to push this hockey puck to the desired destination. But if you train with this randomization, then it's just better. So here it succeeds. And you can see that it's very clearly adaptive. It corrects itself. And it's just not particularly, f like the fact that it's running on a real robot rather than a simulator, this doesn't seem to pose it any a particular challenge. No, that's not, 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 not this version. But, yeah, so that's, I, th I think that's, that's pretty cool. So I want to talk about another work on, an, another result on meta-learning, another very simple thing you could do with meta-learning, which is, well, can you use meta-learning to learn a hierarchy, to learn an action hierarchy. Hierarchical reinforcement learning is one of those really good ideas that don't work yet in reinforcement learning. If you have an action hierarchy, you get a number of really great benefits. You get the ability to deal with very long time horizons and really good credit assignment. And also your exploration is much more directed because when you say, I'm going to choose a high level action, I'm going to go to the store. So now I'm going to the store in a pretty directed way. I think the first hierarchical reinforcement learning paper was done by Jeff on the feudal RL from 1995. But it doesn't, hierarchical reinforcement learning doesn't work even today. But what I want to show is that in the meta learning context, it is very easy to learn an action hierarchy. Think about it. If you have a distribution over tasks and you, tell, and you specify your optimization problem as one of, can I please find low level actions that make it possible to learn new tasks from my task distribution as fast as possible? So here is the system. You say, I've got my policies, the neural, I've got my low level actions and the neural nets. I've got my, I'm going to treat them as low level actions. I'm going to give them to some other learner. And I'm going to run, do a short run of reinforcement learning with this new learner, where it can only use these high level actions. You run it for a little bit, and then look at the performance of your reinforcement learning. So you run your, your reinforcement learning for five minutes. You give it five minutes. You run it for five minutes, you got some results. And then you say, okay, I would like to change my low level actions so that then if, when I run it next time, it's gonna be a little bit faster. So you back propagate through the entire training loop of the reinforcement learning algorithm all the way down through the low level actions. And I wanna show you a video of how it actually behaves in a toy setting. And so after training, 
you have this little ant which is crawling and it has only three sub policies and once it has these three sub policies it is, a, it is able to to learn to solve tasks like this one pretty quickly because the sub policies are good it has you know a sub policy of go forward for 500 steps or go left for 500 steps so in this case it only had 10 sub policy selection and so it succeeded so you just say my goal is to learn low level low level actions which make it possible for reinforcement for a quick run of reinforcement learning to succeed as much as possible so that's it it's a really simple idea and then you just com compute your gradient estimate scale it up a little bit and you can learn these low level actions now of course all these approaches to meta learning have a limitation is that they require you to specify a distribution of the tasks okay and i think that actually this is the biggest problem with the popular approach to learning the non neural architecture search that you have the same limitations of supervised learning. Where if you say, I have a distribution of the tasks, so my training distribution of the tasks must be equal to my test distribution of the tasks. And I think that this condition is almost always false. I think it is very rare to find a situation where the training distribution of the tasks is equal to the test distribution of the tasks. And so it is, will be pretty desirable to develop some kind of learning algorithms which will be successful even when your test case is a little bit outside of distribution. Because if you think of your supervised learning contract, and you do supervised learning, you have a contract with the model. The model says that it promises to give you the right answer as long as the data comes from the, from the correct data distribution, the training data distribution, which is equal to the test data distribution. Under these conditions, the model will succeed. But should your test case be out of distribution, even in one aspect, so let's say it's like almost exactly in distribution, but there is this one way in which it is out of distribution, then the model has permission, according to the contract that you made with it, to give an arbitrarily bad answer. And adversarial examples are a great, are a great instance of that, where you say, okay, it's basically the same thing, I'm just gonna perturb it a little bit, and now the model is hopelessly lost. And it just seems so counterintuitive that humans that this should be the case, because humans seem to be a lot more immune. Although, although it turns out that if you flash a light into a person's eye in a way that's very correlated with their EEG, then you can induce a seizure. So maybe that's an adversarial example for humans. But it's definitely, it really seems unlikely. Humans really don't seem to be susceptible to like I take my image and I just give it a small perturbation it's the same thing I don't think I don't think there is any human that will be confused by that at least given it's my current belief as of December 2017 so anyway my point here is that if we solve the problem of generalizing a little bit out of distribution I think meta learning will work a lot better okay so now I'm going to the last part of the talk, which is self-play. And I think self-play is the, is the coolest thing ever. And it became a lot more popular over the past few weeks because of Alpha Zero. And I just want to highlight this one result of self-play from 1992 by Jerry DeSauro, which looks, if you were to, so I don't know if you can see the figure, but he's, he has like different plots that show the performance of different neural nets. With 10 hidden units, 20 hidden units, 40 hidden units, and 80 hidden units. And now, if you had two more zeros or three more zeros, that would be basically a 2017 paper. He, <laughs> what he did is that he said, okay, he will use Q learning, he will use a neural network to represent the policy, which is trained with Q learning, with self play, to default in backgammon. And not only the neural network humans with backgammon from no expert knowledge about the game 
but it was able to discover new moves that went counter to the conventional wisdom in Bacon. 92. And basically what happened after this is that, I mean, those were, those were the sad times when computers were slow. And so it was kind of lucky that Bagaman was a game so easy that you could solve it with a network with only 80 neurons. You know, makes you wonder what, what are we doing with all our neurons? But it actually happened. And it's just unbelievable how modern this paper is, even though it's so old. Now, of course, self-play has also shown itself in AlphaGo Zero and later in Alpha Zero. You just scale it up a lot, improve your URL, and great things happened. We've also seen self-play work well in Dota, where, which was our result from OpenAI, where we beat the world champion in the 1v1 version of the game. Again, massively scaled self-play. And I want to talk about some of the reasons why I'm excited about self-play. So, like if you think about, if, if you look forward and you say, okay, not only you say, I want to train agents which can solve truly wide varieties of tasks, a truly wide variety of tasks. I want to train an agent which can then accomplish very difficult goals in the human world. Like what, what, what are we going to train this agent on? It's not self-evident. The answer is not self-evident. But I think there is one answer which looks at least plausible today. And I think the answer is the competitive multi-agent environment. You put your 100 agents into a simulated world, and you give them conflicting objectives. And the world needs to be sufficiently open-ended. And so what's going to happen is that as the agents become smarter, as, as, as each agent gets smarter, all the agents will become smarter. And so the society of agents that will be created will always pose a challenge to its members. Just like in the human world, like the, reason, the reason humans find life difficult is because of the other humans. And so if you were, if there, if, if there are, if, if, you, if you were, if, if, you, if you look at the world without humans, then you don't, you know, a squirrel can do just fine in a world with, there are no, you know, a squirrel needs to deal with other squirrels. But there is no need for a big brain if there are no other entities in the world with a big brain. And so I just want to highlight one result from 1994 by Carl Sims. And I actually strongly recommend watching, he has a video on YouTube. So just search for Carl Sims Artificial Life, where he has basically tried to do that. He said, okay, I'm going to take the best computers of 1994 this 33 megahertz, 386. And I'm going to try to evolve artificial life. So he tried to evolve both the neural net controller and the morphology. And he gave them all kinds of little tasks to compete against to, so that they would have an incentive to improve. And he got really cool, beautiful results. And I think everyone should watch, to watch it. This was, you know, artificial life was one other direction that everyone deemed is um, um, unworthy. But it's again, it's because of the sad times of slow computers, which are now beginning to end. We adjusted the cusp of the real compute tsunami. Oh, actually, I have the video. You know what? If I, if I finish, to, if I finish, if I have enough time, I'll show you the video of Carl Sims. Now I want to show you what we did. If you said, okay, Carl, Carl Sims stuff looks really cool. Can we do something similar? Where you say, okay, you try to create a self-play environment in the physical, in a simulated physical world, where here you have a sumo game. You have a game of sumo. You're trying, you know, one of the agents trying to push the other agent outside. And you see, it's, it's, they're pretty good balance. And you see it's how the red humanoid duct, it, it jumped to the side. And they look like little and so you can see how self-play, when done right, gives rise to this potentially unbounded complexity. And I think the challenge there is very similar to how neural nets have been back in the day, where like, you need to set it just right. You know, if your scale of your initialization is wrong, it's not going to work. And so I think the same is here. Like, yeah, if you do it wrong, it's not going to work, but there is a way to do it right. 
And we know that there is a way to do it right, because it's not unrelated to evolution. So yeah, you can see the soccer here, villain to kick. Is it gonna block? No, it didn't block. Okay, so see, so the, the goalie is doing the right thing, and he was able to block. Good move. Oh, this, this is really cool too. Look at this, look at how it's. Okay, so now it, it, duck, it ducked under his hand. And this is an example of uh, the skill transfer, where you say, okay, take the sumo agent and apply big random forces on it. What's going to happen? Is it going to keep its balance? And the answer is yes. And so kind of what, what's really needed for this line of research to really become self-sustaining is for agents which are trained in this kind of an environment to do something useful outside of it. Because ultimately we don't care about agents in a simulated world competing for some artificial resource. But we do care about agents doing our homework and cooking our food. And so what I was actually hoping to do here is that, okay, we train, this, we, we train these agents in simulation, and then we'd fine tune them on some useful simulated robotics task and see if it will be much easier. So that's turned out to be not so trivial to do. But I think that's what needs to happen. You have this big multi-agent world where the agents have this general competency, and then you specialize them to something that we actually need. And so, I want to show one more slide. Yeah, so designing, designing this environment is a challenge. But you can at least see how, in principle, if you were to ride the compute, if you were to surf the compute tsunami that's approaching, this approach could go pretty far. And it connects very nicely with meta-learning, because in meta-learning, you need to have this great big variety of tasks. And I think here, the agents, as they try to compete for the limited resources, will cause a great deal of different challenges to each other. I also want to talk a little bit about one peculiar characteristic of these self-play systems. This self-play systems are different from supervised learning because they let us compute, convert computing to data. If you want more data for your self-play system, you just put more compute in, and the agents get more experience. And the more compute you put into it, the, the faster, the, the, the higher quality the data is, the faster they learn. So one thing that's interesting about our experience with the Dota bot is that in April it was really bad, and then on, on June it was an amateur, on July it was a semi-pro, on late July it was like a strong semi, a strong pro, and then from July to August it improved very rapidly and then defeated all humans. So I think this is characteristic of self-play systems. I don't think this is the exception, I think this is the rule. Because once you fix all the bugs, once your algorithm is good, you just put more compute and it gets better. And why should it stop once everything is done right? So I think this is, this is what I like about self-play, at least in principle, <clears throat> there is an answer of what do you go, what do you do after supervised learning? Because supervised learning is kind of boring, you know? You have your data set, you're never gonna do better than a data set. So now, all we, so now all we do is data set collection. You wanna solve self-driving car, no problem. Self-driving car is no problem. Just get a huge data set and get 10,000 people to label those images for a few years and there you go, you got a self-driving car. But that's not inspiring. But with self-play, at least in principle, you can see that yeah, you put more computer in and the agents just get better and better. There is another really cool thing. So there is some evidence from evolutionary biology that the reason that we have large brains is so that we could deal with other humans. And in general, it is known that more social animals are, have, tend, to have, tend to be more intelligent and have larger relative brain size compared to their less social um, relative species. And you can also see how this kind of system will produce a lot of social skills, theory of mind, the ability to negotiate, all these things that many, many attributes that humans have in their, in, in, that are uniquely human right now, at least in principle, should naturally emerge from the competitive multi-agent environment. Now, finally, I want to finish with the speculative note. So, there is a chance that the final 
actually truly generally intelligent systems will be trained in such competitive multi-agent environment. At least it's conceivable. Now, given our earlier observations about the speed of improvement in self-placed systems, what we can conclude is that if you accept this controversial statement, then it follows that we should see a very, very rapid increase in the competence of the final agents, which will have the general intelligence. And on this uplifting note, I want to thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yes. Um, I have a question. Like, on your agents, when you model a human, like it ends up always to look at his arms. Is that right? I repeat the question. Oh, yeah. The question is on the, in, the re, in the little sumo wrestling video, the agents did lift their arms. And why do they do that? And the answer is that I don't know. <laughs> Yes, on the question of have we tried uh, learning the low level action, you know, the low level primitives in self play environments? And the answer is we have not. Yes, yeah, so will it help? Probably. It's still, it's still pretty nascent. And one of the big challenges in these self-play environments is how you go about measuring progress. Because, you know, let's say that your agents are doing something.